All right, let me call this meeting of the Madison Select Board to order on Monday, March 27th, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. Uh, please join me in saluting the flag. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let the record show all select men are present. Consent agenda, warrant number 29, uh, 3-13-23. Payroll register number 11, uh, dated 3-16-23. And number 12, dated 3-23-23. Make a motion to accept the warrant and the payroll re registration. I'll register. I'll All right, we have a motion and a second to accept the payroll register and warrants as read. Any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? All in favor, the motion carries. Uh, acceptance of the meeting minutes from March 13th, 2023. Make a second. I have a motion and a second to accept the meeting minutes from March 13th, 2023. Any questions? <coughs> Seeing none, all those in favor? All in favor, the motion carries. Old business, Mr. Moody? None, sir. Mr. Mm -hmm. Bean? None. Mr. Gopian? None. Mrs. Dwyer? All set, thanks. All right. Uh, items of communication, Mr. Town Manager? All right, update you on a couple of the uh, remaining tax acquired properties. Uh, the property at 20 Park Street, um, uh, Attorney Ken Lexier has started that uh, eviction process. They were given a 30 day notice uh, on March 15th, so they have until April 15th to vacate that property. Um, after that, uh, we'll probably issue a 21 day notice to remove all personal property. If you've been by there, you notice there's a lot of stuff out back that hopefully they'll come and take. Uh, then I'm gonna have that building secured, uh, plywood on the doors and windows if we have to. Um, and then probably that by early May, the, the board will make a decision on what they wanna do. We'll have somebody walk through it, take a look at it, see if it's worth salvaging uh, or not. Uh, the other property is at 232 Bagley Road. Uh, still no word back from the family members of the deceased property owner. Uh, I've sent letters, I sent a final notice letter. It's really, a, it's a, a courtesy letter because this person that I'm, I'm trying to contact has no claim on the property. Their name's not on the deed. They're just the last known relative of this individual. So we treat with courtesy trying to contact that person. Um, but as of today, I haven't heard anything back. So probably on the first meeting in April, I'll bring that property to you with some proposals as to, to how to dispose uh, of it. Um, Seems like so long ago now, but Peter probably remembers. The weekend of December 23rd, right over Christmas, there was a, a mix of a snow and heavy rainstorm, and that caused a lot of washouts, not only in our community, but all throughout the state. Uh, the governor has declared it a disaster, and now it's gotten federal disaster declaration. So that means through FEMA and MEMA, uh, we'll be able to, to try to recoup some of our costs. So back when they did the original cost estimates, we figured there's about $9,000 worth of, of manpower and equipment power that our highway department had to utilize to, to fix washouts and that sort of thing. So we can apply for reimbursement uh, through the uh, FEMA and MEMA programs now that there's been an emergency declaration. I, give, I, I mentioned Peter Payne because he did an excellent job of documenting everything that was done and made it very easy for us to fill out those applications. Um, Thank you, Peter. Somerset Public Health, I sent out an email to the board earlier this week. They um, would like to propose that they utilize one of the rooms in this building, actually the room right across the hall, uh, one day a week as a community connection for substance abuse where they can meet with people, provide resources and that sort of thing. But they would like to discuss it at length with a couple of board members uh, ahead of time. They, they want to take about two hours, which I really didn't think would fit into a board meeting, uh, but I was wondering if there was a couple of board members that would be willing to, to meet, and they provided some uh, times. Uh, midday, uh, Monday the 3rd, yeah, Monday the 3rd at noontime, or Tuesday the 4th of April at 2. Um, so I'm kind of looking at the bookends here. If Mr. Moody and Ms. Zwire might be available. I would, I would rather do it Tuesday. Okay. Um, the fourth, if, if that's possible. Yep. 
Uh, does, does that work for you, Mr. Rubin? If not, you can get back to me. I, I think I'm all set on that, Tim. Noon time? On the 4th, it'll be 2 o'clock. Oh, 2 o'clock. Yeah, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And that's going to be in this room over well, here? We'll, we'll meet in the same gentleman, either here or there. Yeah. But okay. in this building, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> and that's all I have for items of communication. Okay. All right, number letter G, new business. Uh, number one, discuss payroll increases for fiscal year 24, 2024. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So once again, I'm referring to the sheet with the small print on it and the yellow column right down the middle. This is uh, essentially, it's been unchanged, I think, over the last meeting or so. Uh, it was slightly changed after we were able to close out the contract with the uh, highway union. So their contracted increase for this coming year have been, have been factored in. And I made some adjustments to code enforcement, animal control. Uh, at the request of the fire chief, I made an adjustment to volunteer firefighters. Uh, and there's a couple applications of minimum wage. And for the most part, everyone else was uh, received a 5% increase. And we did make adjustments to town manager pay and road commissioner pay to fit them into that 5% category as well. So what I'm looking for here, and I'm glad to take any questions or any discussion on this, but ultimately what I'm looking for here is, is a motion uh, to set these rates uh, for the coming fiscal year. <coughs> With the understanding of the board and, and myself that this doesn't automatically give somebody this pay, especially if the position isn't filled. Uh, if, the, if the position is filled, then we assume that that's, that's going to be that person's pay going forward. But if there's questions about a position, uh, that gives me a little bit of room. And uh, we'll talk more about code officer in the, in the few minutes, but code officer is a good example. By setting the pay at $25, that would be for somebody who I'm assuming is a certified code officer. If we end up hiring somebody that's not certified or in the process of getting certified, we would start at a lower wage than that. So I just want to make sure we're all in understanding. Right. So. Mr. Moody. Tim, the new employees that, uh, that we hired there in the office, when do they get their first raise and how much? So it all depends on the time in which they're hired. So for those that were hired about four months ago, yep. their, their first wage increase would come July 1st, according to this. And, and how much would that be? The 5%. So, so disregarding the 5%, <clears throat> if there was no 5%, they wouldn't be getting a raise in a period of time? The only other time we've done that is if, um, in some cases, you're, you're dealing with people on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, if we make an offer to hire and the person says, will I get a raise after six months? Right. And then I say, well, I'll discuss that. In most cases, in a case like that, I've been hiring at lower than the rate of that position uh, because we're trying that situation out. And in that case, it would most likely be a 50 cent raise if we, if we did something like that. Okay, so what, what I'm getting at is if, is if we set a 5%, they're not going to get another percentage six months down the road. No. Okay. No. All right. For all of our new employees, we've had one part-time employee that's been there for about eight months, and she and I did discuss a five, a uh, fifty cent raise, uh, and we did that after her six months probation. Yep. The other two employees are not at six months until May or June. Okay. And so my, our understanding is that this would be their raise, and there wouldn't be any more raise down the road. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Until the following year. Okay. Yeah. All right, so looking for a motion to approve. I'll make a motion that we approve the rates as listed here for salaries. Second. I will second it. Any other questions? Any 
questions, any comments? Uh, Mr. Gopian. Yes. On these, uh, on this salary, which you, uh, which you gave, or, or um, they're going to get on this after six months, because that's their usual raise fee, right? Every six months. I, I, I haven't mm -hmm. had an opportunity to do that very often. Typically, when we've hired somebody, that is in their personnel. No, there's no automatic raise after six months in the personnel policy. There's, there's no more step raises. You get your right. cost of living raise at right. July 1st, and that's it. No more step raises. I believe that was taken out a few years ago. Yeah, it was. Yeah. I, I never dealt with it, so it would be yeah, a we had, back. I mean, we had, in the past, there had been step raises. Yeah, every, correct. Every so, many, so often, and it's I not, believe it's not there anymore. I mean, that's got to be four or five years. Well, I, I've never done that. No. Yeah, yeah. It's been quite a while. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? All right. Opposed? All right. We have four in favor, one opposed. Motion carries. Thank you. All right. Number two, discuss budget considerations. All right, and just so we're, we're clear, we're going, we're going to go through these four um, different parts of the budget. Just kind of get an idea of where we're, where we're at for our budget meeting on um, April 5th, I believe. And to kind, of get, to kind of get the board pinned down on what we want to do with them, what we want to do with these four here. Okay? Uh, so letter A says... Full-time code officer and maintenance, which is on page. Well, if, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Yep. If I could just make a couple of observations before we get into letter A there. And in your in your packets, I think you have the, the sheet that looks like this, which is miscellaneous fund balances. Um, Mr. Agopian had asked uh, for this at the last meeting, and I thought it's worth going over. Um, just so that the public and the board is aware of, of what we have in the bank. Um, every town has ARPA funds, American Rescue Plan Act funds. Uh, so I'm just going to start at the top of this sheet. It's okay and work my way down yeah. uh, if there's yeah. any questions. So the town received 488,511.91 cents in ARPA funding. It came in two different tranches. Both have been deposited. Our, uh, our audit keeps the, those funds separate. So if you were to look at our audit, you would see a fund that says ARPA fund, and then you'd see another fund that says undesignated fund balance. So it's not lumped into the, the surplus. Um, so far, we have made four uh, payments out of that fund. One was for hazard pay back in December of 21 for our employees that worked through COVID. Uh, we used 105,000 of it to pave Lower Mills Road. We put 50000 toward the purchase of the newest <coughs> fire truck, and we approved uh, $35,000 in matching grants, of which $9,400 have been paid out, and that, that, so that gives us a balance of 287. The approved committed funds are the remainder of that matching grant fund. That was approved at town meeting last year for 25 dollars and then town meeting approved $60,000 in building improvements that hasn't been spent yet. Uh, just so you know, some of those ideas include new LED lighting for the town office, new windows for the town office, heat pumps for the town office, that sort of thing. Um, so, the, so what's left that we haven't dedicated yet is $202,000. And in this coming budget year, I'm recommending that we, we dedicate those. So I'm, uh, if the board's okay with it, I'm gonna prepare two warrant articles for town meeting. One would be to put 150 plus towards the reconstruction of Bean Street, and then put $50,000 towards the purchases of plow equipment to go with the new plow truck that we are buying. So, so any questions on ARPA funding? There is no more ARPA funding, funding coming. That's, that's it, it was a one-time shot from the federal government. Um, so does anybody have any questions on that? Questions? <coughs> All right, the second box are what we call our G accounts. These are accounts that um, automatically stay dedicated with the funds that are committed to them. We do not have to carry these over year to year. 
So funds that are dedicated to these accounts stay there until they're spent. Uh, you see the library has a pretty uh, significant amount in there. That's because they got a $50,000 grant from the Stephen and Tabitha King Foundation to repair their windows up at the top of the, the building. So that grant is in there so it can be utilized. Um, they're starting some of that work this coming Wednesday, um, doing some preliminary work. Um, the legal fund. This legal fund was established back in the day when we were spending a significant amount of money uh, defending our position against Madison Paper and, and Eagle Creek. Uh, there's about $10,000 balance in that legal fund. Uh, the Main Street Playground, um, there's about $3,600 there. Uh, we'll utilize most of that this year on upgrading our playground chips. Fire equipment, um, as you recall, the town sold the old 1990 tanker truck and the proceeds from that sale were added to this fund so that if there's extemporaneous fire equipment that the chief feels he needs, he has access to these funds. Uh, the OPA playground right out here, there's a balance uh, to uh, maintain that of 7,700. Highway equipment, very similar to fire equipment, has about 34,000 in it. Uh, foreclosed property, uh, through the sale of foreclosed property, uh, we would put money into this account that's got a balance of 14.5. Uh, our revolving loan fund um, has an accessible balance of 31,000. That balance is growing for two factors that the longtime loan that we had through uh, Rhonda Emerson uh, has been paid off and we're also receiving about $1,700 a month in interest only payments from Go Labs right now. That will change next year to principal and interest payments on a $400,000 loan. So that, that fund should increase significantly over the next year or so. Um, last two on the bottom are our TIF accounts. Uh, we budget quite a bit of our uh, income. We get about $10,000 a year in income from the Woodlands TIF. We get about $480,000 a year from the Backyard Farms TIF. Um, I'm, I'm not going to go into a long uh, diatribe about TIFs uh, tonight, but I'm watching the Backyard Farms TIF carefully because they are 18 years into a 20-year agreement. Um, they've gone through, and I'm not speaking disparagingly, it's just the nature of the market, they've gone through four general managers in the last eight years. And so people are always changing up there, so it's hard for me to, to stay in touch. Uh, all of the uh, HR and all of the accounting is out of Ontario, Canada. Uh, so there's nothing local really here anymore since they were sold to the Master Nardi family. Um, so I see two things are gonna happen. One of two things are gonna happen. They're either gonna let this agreement wane, and if it does, then the taxes that are collected in the TIF will now transfer to taxes coming into the general fund. But if that happens, you can bet that backyard farms will come back and say, hey, 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 we, don't, we want a change in our valuation. If you're gonna tax us and, and we don't have tax free anymore, um, and we don't get our money back, we wanna change that valuation. So I'm watching that. I think that's going to happen in the next couple of years. Um, any questions about TIFs? Anything like that? I can talk for hours. Um, all right, undesignated fund balance. That's the last line on the bottom. Right now we're running, as of our um, audit for June 30th, we're running just under $2 million. Um, I, I, I'm hesitant to, to go too far on this. I've already kind of taken into a, 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 the equation the money that, we've, that shows up in undesignated fund balance that we've used to buy a fire truck. So that, that kind of affects it by a couple hundred thousand. That being said, we traditionally bring forward about $400,000 to offset taxes at town meeting. Uh, we probably have room to up that this year, at least to 500000 I don't want to speak too much on that until we get to the budget committee. I'll know a little bit more. Uh, about that position. Uh, mainly the reason I think we can take that out of undesignated fund balance is that revenue sharing from the state has been better than, than, ex than expected. But I don't want to ride that train uh, too long. So any questions about fund balances? That's, that's kind of the money that we, we have that's available. And I just, my point was to show everybody what we've got in the bank so that no one thinks we have a bunch of money just piling up somewhere. Um, how does 
the budget affect your taxes? What impacts your taxes? Right now, the biggest thing that's affecting your tax bill is the raise in the value of your property. And the value of your property is on the rise because of the real estate market over the last three or four years. Eventually, it's going to level out. But right now, we're underwater as a town. We should have a ratio of about 90%. So your value of your house should be close to 90% of what's selling, or vice versa. 90% of what's selling should be close to the value of your house. We're right now about 76%. So the state won't allow you to, every, every town's underwater, it's in the same situation. But the state, the state won't allow you to stay there too long until they start clawing back some of the revenue sharing and that state aid education and all of that. So they kind of incentivize you to get that back up to 90. The way to do that is to, to change the structure and to raise your valuations. One of the things that Shirley and I are gonna look at this year is a structure in the software system that will um, impact newer homes greater than older homes. That's, that's the simplest way to say it. We hope to be able to do it by May so that we can run a test by May and send out mailers to people and say, right now, it looks like with these adjustments, your home value is gonna go from this to this. So that enough people know about it before you set the commitment in August so that they can, be, they can respond and surely can sit down and talk with them. So it's kind of like a mini revaluation, uh, but we're gonna to try to do it uh, as conservatively uh, as possible. So if all your budgets were absolutely flat, taxes would still go up because your value of your property is going up. It, the, but the thing is, the budgets aren't flat. Uh, we're going to talk about expenses here tonight, but we're at a 9.2% increase in our overall municipal budget. <clears throat> the budget that Anson just passed at town meeting in March was a 9.5% increase. Norridgewalk just passed theirs at a 9.5% increase. So it seems to be common that municipalities are dealing with this 9 or 10% increase. <clears throat> uh, the school's budget is out. They've just started. Um, but it's, it's up. It's, it's, it, to the taxpayer, it's up. Uh, the county budget will be up. Uh, we'll talk about reasons about that in, in a minute. So all these budgets that impact you. So right now, if you were to factor in 10% increases to those budgets and a 10% increase to your home value, in order to keep your home values from going, or your taxes from going up, you'd have to drop that mill rate from 18.59 where it is now all the way down to 16 and a half. And that's, you know, I hope I'm wrong, but that's not gonna happen. So, so taxes are gonna go up. So last thing I'll say is there are uh, 325 people uh, that have applied and been approved for tax stabilization. Uh, they're a little bit older than I am, uh, and so you had to be 65 or older. Uh, there was really very little criteria for the state state program, but three so 325 of what I would consider to be our more vulnerable taxpayers will not see an increase. Uh, I went to some legislative meetings this week, and the budget for the governor she has put in about 15 million dollars to reimburse the towns for what they know they're going to lose. Um, 15 million is a drop in the bucket. Um, I talking to a couple of the people that know more about it than I do. Everybody's guessing it's going to be 40 million this year and 60 million next year. Um, so it's it's something that the legislature is looking at, saying, "Who do we open a Pandora's box here, and, and how do we shut it?" Uh, so, you know, stay tuned for there'll be changes on that. What's so, because that, that the 325 that have signed up for that uh, is that percentage-wise with other communities, and maybe checked on any of that. I mean, are we did we not get the message out or? No, I, I was guessing 300 yeah. uh, based on our demographics, how many people owned their own homes, because not only are you just 65, but you have to have a homestead for 10 years. And so you've had to had a home in Maine for a while. Um, we have, we have 3,000 property owners, and I would have guessed that about 300 people would have qualified for this. So it's, it's about what I expected. It's good. Uh, you know, statewide, they've received well over 100,000 applications. So as far as the homestead exemption goes, the 
if anybody out there doesn't have a homestead exemption yeah. on their property, you have until the end of this week to get that to get that into the town office. Just go to the town office. They'll 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 set you up with the paperwork. Uh, that is something. In looking over the tax bills, there are a lot of people that have not taken advantage of that. So that'll take what five hundred dollars off four four to five hundred four four sixty this off year. your tax bill. <clears throat> yeah, it's pretty significant. There's also a lot of talk in the legislature about doing away with this tax stabilization and raising the homestead for folks that qualify over 65 years old. That seems, seems to be maybe a more fair and equitable way of doing it. But, so those are, my, those are my observations before we dive into some of the specifics. Like Chairman Vinziano said, I, I hope that by focusing on these uh, particular sections, I can get a better idea of what the budget will be that I present to the advisory board and the selectmen on the 5th of April at 5.30 in this room. So, and we'll have cheese and crackers. So, so any questions <coughs> before we get into code enforcement? Yeah, Mr. Money. There seems to be some comments out there about <clears throat> when they're learning about 10% increase in, in taxes. My question is, what can we do to bring that down a couple of points? There's got to be something we can do to bring that down to maybe eight, to soften this up for these people. So are you talking about the municipal budget? Yes. Okay. Right. So right now the municipal budget's a 9.3% increase. Right. And that's really what I hope to accomplish tonight. If there's anything we want to bring that down, we'll talk about it right now. Yeah. Uh, this evening. But as far as the overall... You know, I, I don't make, I try, I try not to make them the bad guy, but the school district, if you're concerned, I, I go to the school board. I understand. Go I, to the school board. They, there you go. I understand that, and, and, and that's what a lot of the people do not understand, right. Right. that it is not our budget right. that's you, the big impact between the county and the school, which we have no control over, is what we have to agree with. Well, you you are you are taxpayers, so you do have control over the input to the school budget. You have some control over the input to the to the county budget. But I mean, I, and I think everybody knows. But if you don't know, it's a three point eight million dollar municipal budget. It's a twelve million dollar county budget, which we pay a portion of, and it's eleven million dollar school budget, which we pay all of because we don't share it with any other towns. So we can make an impact here to maybe cut a few thousand, a few thousand there, but at the end of the day, it's just a sliver of the tax rate. Yeah, I know. And, and remember, all of, our, all of our estimates on mill rate have never come through in August, correct. So we've been, we've been off most of the time. So. It's difficult. It's difficult to project that. So I'm trying not to make promises. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, so let's start on with number one, uh, or letter A, I'm sorry, full-time code officer maintenance. Yeah, you, you see on I, what page? I've got four or five pages here, but this, this one that has the little uh, colored budget lines at the top is really uh, where, where I'm starting. <coughs> and, and again, that's, that, that's really there for your references. Um, I'm going to go back to uh, 2017. Uh, Bobby Dumphy was finishing up. He, he was able to work through December of 2017. And he had been the code officer for well over 10 years, uh, maybe on to 15 years. Never charged us mileage rarely ever asked for anything as far as uh, finances. Just enjoyed doing it and he did a great job. And everybody that worked with Bobby loved him because he was, he was a dumpy. <laughs> and so um, when he got done, he recommended that we look at Susan Hathaway. And Susan Hathaway was retiring from a code enforcement job and she was living up in the <coughs> Oaks. And so uh, she took the job for us for about a year and a half. Um, she was quite taken back by the pay when we got to the point of talking about 
And at that point, we were talking $18 an hour. And she was making $35 an hour as, a, as an engineer. And so she did it for a while. Uh, it wore on her. The pay wore on her. And then she had an opportunity to work from home in the forks making 30 bucks an hour. And so she said, I'm done. So a few months go by, and we end up stumbling upon this young man named Amos uh, Mishu, who had just graduated from Kennebec Valley Community College. And while he was at KBCC, he took all the certification courses to be a code officer and a licensed plumbing inspector. He had no experience. He'd never driven a nail. He'd never been on a construction site, but he was a certified code officer. So we said, do you want a job? And he said, yes. And we put him out in the field with Dave Savage, and Dave Savage says, this guy's good, and he's, he's certified. So we offered him a job at $22 an hour, and he started in October. By February, the town of Winslow had hired him full-time, $25 an hour. And I had gone through this budget process with Amos in mind two and a half years ago, thinking, if there's a way we can make this a full-time position, I might be able to keep Amos. And, but he was gone before that could happen. So last year, I presented a budget for code enforcement, full-time with benefits. Uh, total package for a code officer was 77000 That included $5,000 for a contracted planner, which we use during our planning board meetings. Um, and as you remember, last year, during this exact time, I had $77,000 in the budget for code, and we were trying to find ways to shrink that down, shrink that increase down. And so I said, well, well I don't have anybody. So let's take 25,000 out of that, and if we need it, we'll carry it forward afterwards. And you know, you know the rest of that story. Um, so here I am again, bringing a full-time position for code enforcement and facilities maintenance. And I've looked at other towns, and I've given you a list here of Jay, Millinock at Madawaska, Norwich Walk. Skowhegan's a little tricky because you know they're a larger community. But all those communities have created positions within the last couple of years that have code, enforce code enforcement and something else. So our proposal has always been um, facilities maintenance. And maybe I didn't explain it well. Uh, it, we got a lot of pushback as it's a janitorial or custodial position. No, it's not. It's somebody that we need to have in place to take care of our buildings and take care of our facilities. I'll use, use this example. We have a road commissioner that is charged with taking care of the roads. And so anything that needs to be done on the roads, that road comm commissioner figures out what the problem is, figures out what needs to be done, and then uh, comes and works with the town to get the money and fixes and maintains those roads through capital projects. We have a town office, this building, a library, uh, a fire station, the East Madison Fire Station, and we have a communications tower with a building out there. All of those buildings need capital improvements. All of them need things to be done. I'm proposing that we have somebody who is our code officer and our facilities maintenance person that does the necessary things to find out what this building needs and then works with the town manager and the, town and the selectman to figure out how you get that money and get those things done. Um, so th there's, there's a lot that goes into that. Um, and I even put on here uh, what, I, what I would see as a typical five-day work week just to, just to help you get an idea of, of, of what I'm talking about. Uh, and I'll just refer to these other sheets here. There's a, there's a, a job description that I drafted uh, well over a year ago. I really haven't changed it any. Um, and then uh, Mark Doty's here from the planning board and from the Lake Association. And he had submitted a letter last year uh, talking about why, especially with Shoreland zoning, a full-time code officer is important. So the number is 81.7. That's, that's what I'm presenting as a full-time position, plus that planning contract. Any thoughts or comments on that? You 
Mr. Moody. Is there a new page? Because the one I got says 75. Oh, all right. Okay, I got you. So if you're comparing these two sheets, so this sheet here shows his hourly wage and benefits to 75000 This sheet here adds to that some travel, about 1500 supplies, about 300 and the contracted planner at about 5000 That's what gets your total in that department up to 81.7. So do I... Um, just a quick question, Tim, with regard to building permits and that sort of thing. Is there a lot going on with that? I know it's one, two times, so probably not, but you That's you it, it's, it's getting busy. Yeah, I, was gonna I say mean, there, there, there are people out there that are trying to lock down contractors yeah. now yeah. because they've missed the window for, for hiring people. Yeah. Um, you know, building permits, we usually do about 65 to 80 a year. Mm -hmm. Plumbing permits, we probably do about 30 a year. Um, and I'll admit that's that's not full time work. That's two days a week, mm -hmm. uh, basically. And but inspections and that sort of thing. Once you have inspections to add into that. Yeah. You have some significant projects going on in front of the planning board right now that are going to going to take some some time and, and, and guidance. And that's all part of this. Position. And, and, and that's you know yes, that's all part of that position. Mr. Gopi. Uh, yes, uh, <coughs> Tim. Uh, this five thousand from KV Cog is that going to be included in this or is it included in it now so if you if you look at this figure here on that top of the page of 81 7 yep that's right from the proposed budget the big long sheets mm -hmm. so that 5,000 is in there right now so that that 81 7 is actually 70 uh, 76 Right. So the, the what the person of the full time position will be earning is fifty two thousand dollars in pay, plus benefits, plus FICA, plus retirement, and, and all of that stuff. Um, and then we have a, a small line for supplies and a small line for travel. Right. But that five thousand from KV Cog is in this eighty one. Yep. And that goes to KV Cog as it's spent during the year. Okay. So when um, Joel Greenwood is the fellow's name, when he comes to a planning board meeting, he submits his hours for the work that he's doing for our planning board. So and he's ha handling questions on a on a pretty high level. That uh, you know, as you get a more experienced code officer, then we wouldn't need that. But we haven't had a code officer, so that's why we've had it. Uh, Mr. Moody. Uh, Tim, can you explain the, a little bit more on this contracted plan of $5,000? Yep, yeah, that, that's a Ke Kennebec Valley Council of Governments. They provide that service to us. They also provide it to many other towns like Skowhegan. It's a gentleman named Joel Greenwood. He'll come to our planning board meetings, answer high-level questions, help the board work their way through the myriad of state laws as, as it pertains to the shoreland zone as it pertains to subdivision and site review so he's our contracted planner because and, and we've been doing this for three years because we haven't had a qualified code officer to answer those questions you know years ago bobby dumphy used to be able to guide the planning board through okay. most of that okay but without someone that's why we've contracted and like i said to mr gopian if we have an experienced full-time code officer then we will not need to have a contracted planner in the future Okay, what were your what were your thinking about as far as a uh, hiring as far as a uh, non-certified? What pay range are you talking about? You can only be a non-certified code officer for one year. Uh, I know. So that. the state fire marshal's office says you can hire somebody and appoint them, but they have to be certified in a year. So 
I would probably work in the range of 24 non-certified and 25 certified. And, and that can be done in a year? The certification? Yeah. Yeah, the certification can be done in about three months. Oh, okay. Yeah. All, all of the training and the exams are available online at the State Fire Marshal's office. So. Okay. Is there a cost factor with that? No. So it's available to municipalities at no cost. Oh, okay. Yep. They, they know that Madison's not alone. Every mm -hmm. other town is struggling with this code officer situation. Yep. Uh, Mr. Town Manager, I, I, I am in favor of this. <laughs> but my question to you, I guess, is, is, <coughs> our, is our town ready for this? Is it ready for a full-time person to be looking at property and looking at uh, your collection of vehicles that you have in your yard and saying something to you about it? And I mean, are we ready? Because I mean, we're going to get. I mean, we're going to have more people here than than we have right now. So. The, uh, the job of the code enforcement officer is explained in the title. If you, at town meeting, pass codes and ordinances, somebody's got to enforce them. And for years, if we've been lax on property maintenance, it's been because we haven't had the manpower to do it. And if we've been lax on holding people accountable who may not be doing things right by the law, it's because we didn't know about it. So we can continue the way we are to struggle to fill that position. And yeah, people's properties, the, the, the abutting landowners will be upset because nothing gets done. Mm -hmm. And so if we start doing things, you're gonna make another set of landowners upset. As we walk this delicate road <coughs> between property rights and property values, your right to treat your property the way you want it, whether you like it or not, impacts your neighbor's values. And so, <laughs> you, can't, you, you really can't win in this situation. Mm -hmm. But you've got codes on the books. If you're not gonna enforce them, you might as, well, you might as well erase them. You might as well go to town meeting and say, we're not gonna do property maintenance anymore. And then go to town meeting and say, well, we're not gonna enforce, we'll let DEP deal that. We'll, we'll let the state deal with that. And the state doesn't like that either. Mm -hmm. So, okay, I'm just just want to throw that out there, <laughs> Mr. Porton. In in working around Central Maine and other parts of the state, the key word is a capable, capable code enforcement officer, not just a warm body in the position that does not have the capability to persuade somebody to follow the code and what, why he's there or she's there. You will never have a long-term capable code enforcement officer unless you have a full-time job for them. Or you're just going to be training to go to the next full-time job that they can get. If you can get a capable long-term code enforcement officer, the town will be better for it. There's no question about that in my mind. But if you don't give a full-time job, you're going to be chasing a code enforcement officer for years and years until you luck into a Bobby Dumphy or a Leo Mayo or somebody that's coming into retirement and they're more than happy to work for two days a week pay. It, it, it's just the fact of nature. You, you can go into a town and within 15 minutes dealing with the code enforcement officer, you know if that person is capable and knows the ordinances and has any experience at all. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hi. Mr. Chairman, yes. uh, Mary Tomlinson is on Zoom. I believe she has her hand up. I didn't know if you had a comment, Mary. I do. Um, not having a full-time code enforcement officer can certainly um, create backlogs um, or difficulties when there's construction going on. My contractor this past summer had to wait several days before he could get a permit.
comment because there was no one available. So when you have delays like that, um, that may dissuade people from building or adding on or what have you. And, and as a member of the planning board, that code enforcement officer is extremely important. A very, very important um, <coughs> Thank you, Mary. Thanks. Yes, sir. Evening, Mark Doty. Yep. I'm the president of the Lake West Runcid Association. Tim referred to the letter that I, I wrote you all last October. I got a little new information that we developed in February. I got the audit report from Shirley Bartlett and put it all together. And of the properties that are associated with the lake, in other words, those that are on shore and those that are back three, four, five tiers, the valuation is close to $59 million for the town of Madison. And the taxation is close to $1.1 million. So if you uh, give me a moment to make a, an example. If our lake becomes infested with invasive aquatic plants, the commonly used figure is a 20% decline in valuation and thus taxation. <clears throat> the code enforcement officer has nothing to do with invasive aquatic plants, but he's got something to do with, or they have something to do with phosphorus loading, and that is shoreland zoning to a T. Now, I'm not saying that it would, phosphorus loading and persistent algae <coughs> blooms would lead to a 20% decline, but if even if it left led to a 10% decline, you're still talking about $6 million in valuation and $100,000 in taxes. And that's year after year after year. So sheer economics says get a code enforcement officer out there on a consistent basis. And the second point that I want to make is, besides the economic argument, we kind of like that the lake, and I'm sure everybody else does, the way it is, and that takes a little bit of work to keep it in this kind of shape, especially with all the other factors that are infringing on, on our lake. So hopefully you guys can see your way clear to full-time CEO. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Thank you. So, Mr. Town Manager, in our budget, have we allocated or put up some money for supplies for things for this person jobs to do? I mean, is that something that, that we have available? Are you talking about the, the maintenance part of it? The maintenance part yeah. of it, yes. So the maintenance part of it would come out of those particular maintenance <coughs> loans in each of those departments. So I don't think we have to allocate a, a large sum of money. And if that person's working on a fairly large capital project, that will have to come uh, before the selectmen to come out of e either out of one of those G accounts or have to go down the <clears throat> All right, so we, I, we don't need a motion. I don't necessarily motion. think you need a motion on this since you've got the budget committee coming up right. in, in a, next week, uh, essentially. Any, any is, other questions on code enforcement slash um, maintenance? Why? All right, so our, our final vote would be, our final vote would be on right. April 5th. On April 5th, the, both the Budget Committee and the Selectmen will have a chance to talk about the entire general government budget, which will include that particular category for code enforcement. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, number, letter B, policing coverage. So we got some last minute information. I think I sent you an email today. So what I'm gonna hand out supersedes what's in your packet, except yours, Mr. B. You've got the good packet because you never come to the town to pick up your stuff. That's why, that's why you got a good one. So. Isn't that why you email it? Is that why you email it? So I can print it? <laughs> I want you to save that school's ink. That's what I'm trying to do. So. All right. So originally, we were looking at a policing budget that contains essentially four personnel. One admin personnel and three patrol deputies. 
That's down from last year, where you had three patrol deputies, a school <coughs> resource officer, and an administrative person. Um, school resource officer uh, left our district uh, early on in the fiscal year and has not been replaced. So the budget is increased primarily <coughs> due to the negotiations that are going on right now between the county and the uh, deputies and the, the, the union, police union. They're, they're trying to negotiate a new contract that will take effect on July 1st. You know full well, the sheriff's been here to testify to this, that Somerset County is the lowest entry level pay of any law enforcement in the state. And they're trying to rectify that with this uh, union negotiation. And the sheriff gave me an initial budget that was based on what they were going to offer. Through the force of negotiation, that figure has risen. Um, due to the fact that this contract has not been ratified yet, I can't talk about the specifics. But the bottom line is, I got a budget today that's $50,000 higher than the budget the sheriff gave me in February. And that budget in February was $100,000 higher than what we paid last year. So we're looking at an overall increase of $150,000 just so they can fund what they need to pay deputies and recruit deputies. Uh, and we won't get into the shortage of law enforcement, that's, that's pretty much statewide. So because we have not paid for a SRO, there was some savings, and I got a little aggressive on the savings after talking with the county finance officer. And so basically, that $50,000 increase, I'm going to use our savings from not paying an SRO to keep that figure at 589. And so that's what I'm proposing in the budget. I was hoping to come to you with, with a $50,000 savings, but that got eaten up in budget negotiations with the police union, which is a, a fact of life in our current uh, workforce. So. I'll be glad to try to answer any questions you may have uh, about policing, but right now you're looking at a total of 589, three patrol deputies, guaranteed three, uh, and an admin person in the office at 26 West Avenue. we did not have an admin person in the office, what would that do for us? So I've talked with the sheriff about that, and there's some pros and cons to that. Uh, the sheriff likes, obviously, having the presence of a person there, um, because all deputies in the county have take-home vehicles. All deputies in the county have take-home vehicles. That's becoming a huge issue in, in municipal and county uh, law enforcement. They all have take-home vehicles now. So we don't park any police cars at 26 Western Avenue anymore. So the sheriff likes to have a presence there. She's there 32 hours a week. We get about four to six walk-ins a week, 15 to 20 a month. Um, so that, that serves the public generally. If you were to eliminate that position out of this budget, uh, that would save you about Fifty to sixty thousand dollars. However, the sheriff brings up a good point: having an administrative person on site saves him a lot of stress administrating these deputies in in house at the jail. So there would have to be a factor, an administrative cost factor, that's plugged back into this budget. It's not as simple as just removing all the pay and benefits of an admin person. So there's some pros and cons to doing that. <coughs> Any questions, Mr. Hagopi? Yes. Uh, how can we put a contingency fund with these fifty-five thousand? We've had a contingency fund with the county for years because the budget figure that they've give, given us, they've never been able to uh, spend all that money because they've never been able to hire enough deputies. 
So any savings that we got, we kept in a contingency fund that for years helped us offset the costs to the taxpayer for policing. And it's in, and I, from what I've guesstimated from talking with the county finance office, it's, it's favorable about $45,000 right now. I'm hoping by the end of the fiscal year there'd be about 55000 there. So that's not a flush fund, I guess. That's not, that, that, if we don't use this, it goes back into this contingency fund. It's, it stays there, and it's accounted for by the county. Well, we could get more into that. No? If, so right now, the new county budget for Madison is $645,000. And we're going to take 55 out of that contingency fund, so we're only going to charge the taxpayer 589. Mm -hmm. If during the course of the year, they don't fill those positions, we generate some savings on that. But we've whittled away all the positions. Years ago, we used to pay for five deputies, and they could only hire four. So then we dropped it to four deputies, and then they could only hire three. Sometimes two mm -hmm. is all, all we had. So every time they couldn't hire a deputy, that money came back to the town. For many years, that money didn't go in a contingency fund. That money went into the legal fund so that we could pay our lawyers to fight Madison paper. So it, it's all been you know, a juggling act for these several years, but since that Madison paper deal has closed, we've used it as a contingency fund, knowing that this day was coming, that the wages would have to be increased. So, isn't, isn't that the fund that we used to buy the cruises out of, Tim? We did utilize that fund to pay for cruisers. That's now, what I thought. In, in this budget, cruisers are already factored in. Okay. So, so there's no additional. But we used to. That's correct. Yeah. yeah. There's no additional cost for cruisers. All right. Any other questions, Mr. Ford? You, you got me thinking about something. When you said that if the person went back, went over to the county jail we would have to be hit with some of the costs. But during the 32 hours a week that that person's in Madison, how much of those hours are they working for stuff for the Somerset Sheriff's office? I, yeah, I, I don't know if there's an easy way to break down that. Well, if there's only six or seven people coming in a week, and they're there 32 right. hours, I'm sure the sheriff is feeding work for that individual to right. do. That's, that's why I would say it's not as clean as just removing all $70,000 out of there. Just so. throw that back at him. Yeah. What he could help us with that, yeah. that person's working on his work. And here's, here's what he told me to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> the, sh the sheer savings between Madison having their own police department and the sheriff overseeing it, the sheer savings is in the cost of a chief. The, sh the sheriff represents that position as the police chief. And for many, and for, and for many years, the sheriff took flack from the commissioners because the county commissioners thought that they should be charging Madison more for administration. So we, we've, we've tried to balance that road as best we can. All right, any other questions for the, for the town manager? I can make a statement about the police department. We're getting nowhere near the coverage we did a year ago. I've been to many, many car accidents. We've been to many, many medical calls, and there's a big delay. A year ago, there wasn't this. We're paying 500 some thousand dollars, and we're not getting the coverage we're paying for. We just going to get that up today. Thank you. All right, any other questions? It's stuck, Donnie. It's stuck. Um, that's the town manager. We're moving on. Yep. So, I wanted to, to discuss Backyard Farms TIF. For years, we've had a TIF budget that allocated certain things to come out of the, the general budget so that you wouldn't have to pay taxation on it. One of the largest line items in there is, is salt. We budget about $75,000 a year for salt. And, I, and you can see in this sheet from the expense report, 
so far this year we've spent 63,000 of that 75,000. Um, salt's up around 70, 71, 72 dollars a ton. Used to be 55, 58 dollars a ton. So just like everything else, the price of salt is, is going up. And we need it. We actually need more salt these days because we have more rain and sleet events in the winter than we have good old fashioned snow events in the, in the winter. A couple weeks ago, we got about six or eight inches of snow. And those guys at the town garage were just tickled. They said, man, we love plowing this stuff, right? <laughs> it's chasing the ice and the rain that they hate. Um, so what I proposed in the budget is a $27,000 move. So of that $75,000 for salt, I'm proposing that we get used to putting that back into the public works budget taking it a couple steps at a time over the next couple of years. And so I didn't dump all 75 back into the public works, but I'm recommending a, you know, a third of it uh, this year. You know, that's, uh, that's just my recommendation. If you don't want to do that and just put it all back in TIF, you can do that and save yourself $27,000. So. But it's coming. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just telling you, the, the days are numbered on this TIF budget. So. Right, but that but it will be offset by the taxes that come in, correct? That's correct, but you're going to have to adjust. You're going to have that, to adjust that, your that first year is going to be wicked high because you're going to take a big adjustment and you don't know how much of your taxes are coming in because you know that Backyard Farms is going to ask for a revaluation. Right. They haven't bothered to ask for a revaluation because they're getting their taxes back. So I'm just saying, in my opinion, it's better to move a little bit now than to try to move it all over to one big lump sum. Okay. All right, any questions on that? And we can talk about that on the fifth, obviously. Yep. Yes, Willis? I guess my question is, do you know the vision for how you're going to increase it in future years? Oh, I've, this year? I've got a spreadsheet on that. I think the last time I shared that was Mr. Elias was on the board. so. For, for kicks and giggles, I'll dig it out, and I, I'll, I'll show you what the transition looks like. In all accounts, or, or just the, the TIF? Just yeah. the TIF. I mean, I'm yeah. talking, talking about every, every account the TIF comes out of. Right. The TIF, the TIF basically will affect things like um, recreation, fire a little bit, highway, and paving projects the most. So. Did yeah. you get TIF in your budget last year? Did I get TIF in my, how do you mean? Uh, in town meeting, and they put 42,000 or something like that in. Right, so if there's four different articles yeah. that have a, a TIF adjustment in those. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've tried to wean those down every year. Used to be those were as high as $277,000. Last year they were 150, I'm gonna recommend 120 this year. I'm trying, I'm trying to wean that down too. So there's not a big shock. Yeah. So. Bliss? Jim, I'm not sure I was understood. Um, specifically, salt. Is this year going to put 27,000 or 25 or whatever? What will it be next year? And what will be probably the last year of the ticket fee? Right. I, I, I'd move all 75 over there in a three year period. So 25 this year, 50 next year, and then 75. So it's out of TIF and back, back into the uh, public works budget where it always was. So. Okay, Mr. Ford. As you're saving it, where is it going? As I'm saving what? The $25,000 on salt. That money's there. You're not going to spend it because you're weaning us down. Where is it going while you're weaning us down? <sighs> I always shake my head when you walk in the door. <laughs> always a good question. I'm. What, I'm, what I want to propose to the board when we get to looking at the TIF budget for this year in 2023 is making it more project related rather than expense related. You've got a million dollars we got to spend on Preble Avenue. You've got a million dollars on Houghton Street. You've got a million dollars on Heald Street. Now that's mostly the sanitary district, but we got to pay our part. It's, that's where that stuff's going to go. Projects. All right, paving projects. Oh, good transition. Huh. All right, the, uh, the, the spreadsheet on this side uh, is on the back of an invoice from uh, Fine Line Paving. 
They're a local company that helps me uh, and previous road commissioners get budget numbers. So they went through and, and looked at most of these roads on here. Now, you members of the public that are looking at this list of roads, remember, we're not promising anything here, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> this is just what's come up that might need to be done. Uh, things usually change between now and, and August. Um, so you see the list on the left-hand side of the roads and what needs to be done. An apron is simply the last 50 feet of a road as it meets the highway. Um, that, on a dirt road, that gets torn up all the time. We've done it on West Runset Road, we've done it on Kincaid. So we'll, the next one that was on the list was Trolley Line. Um, so you can see the columns. And I've got spring of 23. That's utilizing the money that we've already got in the bank that we haven't used yet from what was approved at last year's town meeting. And I think we've got enough money in the bank to do spring, summer, and town road right here in town prior to July 1st. We can get that done. And those are all just shimming it over. They're shimming overlays, yeah. Yep. So the other roads that are listed there Thomas Street, John Street, Naomi, Beach Road, Boardman Road, and a little bit of Trolley Line Drive. Those are what we're going to propose to take to town meeting. So I, I, I put in, for paving projects, $230,000. So this, this is where that two hundred and thirty comes out, two twenty seven dollars roughly there. So that's what we're asking town meeting to raise from taxation at this year's town meeting. Then we have TIF and ARPA. Uh, there's a little bit of work left to be done on River Road. If you've driven on that, you realize that some of the road has been moved over. Uh, there's a short strip that hasn't yet and needs to, it needs to be done. Uh, whether When we get to that, I don't know, but that, that needs to be done. And then for ARPA, there's a considerable amount of money that needs to be set aside for um, Bean Street because uh, after talking with... Um, fellows at the highway department, Peter Payne, and talking with um, the sanitary district, uh, we, we need to do Bean Street. And, and what, what they're designing right now is a plan for the sanitary district to fund the entire project, most likely through a combination of a grant and a loan. And when their work is done, then the town pays for the catch basins and our portion of the paving. And that's anywhere between two hundred and fifty dollars and $350,000. So that's where we're, we're trying to pull that number together. So any, any questions on our, our major road work paving projects? So the, the spring of 23, those are, those are money we already have yep. available to us. Yep. The rest of it, the, the summer of 23, that two twenty seven goes to town meeting. Correct. If we decide to go to town meeting. Right. right. Uh, the TIF money is already there. Yep. And then the last one has to go to town meeting. Yeah, we, we'll break that up into different articles that will okay. be approved. The opera. Right. Okay. Right. And what are we doing to Beach Road? Beach Road would probably be a shim and overlay. Yeah. Okay. And if you've been on Bean Street, <laughs> Unless you live there, you don't go back. <laughs> it's not good. Try to find another way. It's not good. <laughs> so Unfortunately. That is, that is something that needs to be done, and especially if sanitary is ready to move. Water, too? There's, there's very little that needs to be done for the water district in there. What, I mean, sadly, one of the reasons the Bean Street is the way it is is because all the water cuts have already been done. Yeah. And, and that's what makes all the craziness yeah. in there. Is Bean Street going to have like a, will be sidewalks down on it or will it be wide enough so at least you can have a lane so that you can have bikes and sidewalks mm -hmm. if you don't put a sidewalk on it? So the recommendation right now is to change what is existing there. So right now there's Bean Street, a little grass, and then a sidewalk. Mm -hmm. We would recommend, and, and Peter and I have talked about this, getting rid of that little strip of grass and putting a curb sidewalk there. So you'd have a little bit more travel lane mm -hmm. <coughs> in the curb sidewalk. It would be easier to, to clean up that way as well. Because right now we have to drive the snowblower and the loader on the sidewalk to get that done. So should, that's, that's different. It should look like Garfield Street, Morrell Street, and then Clifford Street is what it should look like when it's done. So that, that Bean Street is 
is going to be contracted out. Oh yeah, the, the sanitary district will do, will do all that. Right. All right. Yeah. All right, any other questions? All right, one more thing I want to go through. And it kind of gets back to Mr. Moody's point. Um, and that's this sheet in your in your packets, which is a um, a summary sheet by by article. <coughs> so when you look at the town uh, meeting uh, warrant, you have articles for general government, public safety, public utilities. So how do we save money? And are there savings that we can have. If you, if you look at this, the, the non-capital increase is 427,000. But most of that's in public safety, public utilities, public works, and general government. All those other increases are, are fairly nominal. The reason some of these budgets are up is because the department heads and I, when we were putting them together, did not anticipate the board approving any carry forward in July of 2023. I, I know I can't promise anything, but the fire department budget is going to come in well under budget this year. The public works highway is going to come in well under budget. We have two positions we're not funding in there. So there's going to be significant savings in those budgets that you could reduce line items now and carry forward as needed, which we have done for every year that I've been here. So I, I'm saying that you could probably save $50,000 right now by just reducing fuel lines, special projects lines, in highway and fire, and I could present to the advisory board and the selectmen a budget that's at least $50,000 lower than this if we are going to anticipate utilizing carry forward as we, as we have in the past. General government, we're going to use most all of our budget. Recreation is going to use it all. Community services, the library, you know, most of those are going to go. Town owned properties, we're going to exceed the budget, unfortunately. Um, but those two, fire and highway, th those two could survive a reduction knowing that you would carry forward some money at the end of the budget year. I throw that out there. It was a hot topic over the course of the last eight months. But I'm saying we budgeted more in anticipation of no carry forward. sense not to carry it forward because if it's in your budget this year you're going to use it just it's 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 just the way it is everybody's going to spend it right now just because that money's there for them to use they're going to find something to use it for and if you let them carry it forward they are going to use it for more needed items more needed projects if something may come up that they can't even anticipate right now but all of a sudden this piece of equipment or something broke down and they're going to use it more. It's wasteful. They're going to find something to use it for. If you're not going to let them carry it forward and they know they're not going to carry it forward, they're going to use it. It's just the way it is. And they will get better use out of it if you just let them carry it forward. It's just they would use it more wisely. They have been very, I mean, I know, I work for the town office. They are very thoughtful, they put a lot of thought and process into their budget, and they anticipate that, okay, we'll get some of this carried forward so we, we won't have to maybe budget for this because there will be something carried forward so that if we do have to do this, then we can. I mean, I just know that from working previously with every department head that's ever been in there since my time. It just makes more sense, and I just think you serve the community, the taxpayers better. Let's take open. Yes. So what you're saying is that the department heads are going to waste the money? They're going to use it. They're going to use it on something. It's just, 
then whatever comes up, then it's just tough luck. Or they set up a new, yeah. I mean, they have to prepare ahead. There's no reason for them, it's just like this, I, I'm not for carry forward. I've been saying that all along. When you come out of that meeting from the public, that's what your budget is for the year. And if you have money, which you take out in August, where the money's all situated now, everybody's got uh, everything situated, the money's all turned in. And then that goes to general fund, which helps it for, to save the taxes. Very simple. So, as you said earlier, Mr. Town Manager, we're making a, we're making a trend. When the uh, TIF money, we're going to make a transition. We're making a transition this year, correct? To no carryover. No carry that's what this budget okay, that so was that's presented to you. We're, we're, so if you want, if you want right. this same budget to be presented on April right. 5th, the anticipation was come July, we're not going to, nobody's going to ask for carry over. So if, that, if, that's, if that's what you want me to present to the budget committee, I certainly will do that. Any questions on the board? Are we willing to go with carry forward? I mean, I would go with carry forward. I don't have I don't have a problem with it. I think it's it, it's just a different way of doing it. It's a, it's another way of doing it. I mean, you either do what we're going to do right now and, and budget more money for next year, and that point forward we'll use those numbers, or we use numbers to reduce, re, or we use those carry forward to reduce what goes to the taxpayers. And it's it's one or the other. Yes, this is why. Um, I'm just, I'm totally for carry forward. I'm new to the board as of two years, two and a half years ago, almost three years ago. Um, I'm learning as I go along. Um, we've always done it and it's always worked. Um, and it gives them some leeway with their funds. I, I just, I am completely for it. So just want you to know that. This is why if you get reelected, you. You will no longer be new to the board. <laughs> Thank you. Right. No, I'll be an old, old time. Yes. Uh, sure, we'll use that anyway. So I can. Yeah. And it's a Any other questions, Mr. Moody? Tim, it wasn't carryover usually fire and highway. Most of the carryover was held in those areas. Most of it. Right, because with the public works, they had the largest budget. Um, and their budget was predicated on how bad the winter was. Right. So usually in a mild winter, you'd come out with forty or fifty thousand dollars left over, and they would allocate it to especially the the biggest part of the carry forward for highway was the special projects line. Right. And that and that runs about twelve to twenty thousand dollars, and again that just gives you the flexibility to fix something that you didn't foresee happening. Uh, fire likes to have it too when a piece of equipment goes down or, or a vehicle fails. Uh, so the whole purpose of carry forward is to be able to respond to unanticipated things that you can't fi figure out a, you know, a year ahead of time when you're doing your budget. Yeah. Yes, yeah. So could you look back and see from previous years, like each department had whatever it was for carry forward, okay? And then, so now they're going to do their budget in anticipation that they can have this carry, this dollar amount that's left over, carry forward. And I'm just trying to explain this right. But so they decrease their amount because they are anticipating this right. carry forward. Right. But now, the next year, did they get to carry forward that? What dollar amount, you know what I mean? What dollar amount did they get to carry forward the next year? What dollar amount did they underspend it by? Yeah. So maybe there's some kind of a consistency there, and yeah, maybe lots of times they don't need it, but you they kept their budget down in anticipation they could have it, but they've not had to use it. So in the end, they're really not. Over the years, it's mostly just a few thousand dollars, with a few exceptions. Special projects line for highways usually about twelve, fifteen thousand dollars that we carry forward just for special projects. Um, of course, all the, the capital projects, if we're saving for a fire truck and we haven't got the truck yet, we, we carry that money forward. Um, there was a little thing called COVID that caused our election 
uh, town clerk to, to need a lot of help. And uh, we carried forward about $30,000 to pave that parking lot out here and create a space for people to come and vote. I mean, so those are the things that we've carried forward money for uh, in the past. The most recently, probably the most controversial, was we had to do with our highway department the same thing that the sheriff is doing with his deputies. We had to go hire people, and our rates were so low that we had to raise those rates. The only way to pay for that was to carry forward money, and that's what we did this year for the highway department. So those, those are some of the big ones. Those are, those are out of the ordinary. Most, of, most times, just a few thousand dollars. There's, there have been years where we've only carried forward thirty or forty thousand dollars across four or five departments. I mean, we we also can get a reasonable assurance from this board that they'll they will support carryover or not support it. But you've got to remember, we don't do this till July. We're going to have a, we're going to potentially have two yep. different two different members. Yep. So that's going to go all. I mean, I right. I, I don't know. We, you could get a short. You could get assurance either way. Well, and I that that's that's risky. So. Yeah. So. All right. Any other questions? Thank you. And you, I'll, 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 I'll work on budget packets for the advisory right. board and the select board this week. One more thing. Yes, Mr. Tim, can you can you give us a list of? What areas would be projected as carryover? Maybe there's you know two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yep. All right, moving forward, discuss ordinance updates. Letter A, number three A, chapter four eight four, site review. This is a pretty straightforward one. Uh, as the planning board's been going through site review on a large solar project. We realized that we updated um, a line about fees. And what it should have said was that fees for site review will be doubled on projects that fall within a large scale like solar because it takes so much more time to, for the planning board to review. Our current fee for site review is $250. If you bring us a large scale solar project, that fee is going to be $500. Inadvertently, whoever did this language, which was probably the town man, uh, he put in all associated town building permits, which would raise our town building permits by double on solar fees, which the way we do building permits now is, is a certain amount of cents based on square footage. The way we do solar panels is we do the square footage of the panels. So a building permits for a solar array should cost about eleven to $15,000. And, 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 that, and legitimately, that's what it should cost, based on surveys from other towns in the state. So what I'm proposing is that we simply take the town meeting, removing of the language of doubling the building permit, and just keep the language of doubling the site review fee. So that, that was my mistake. That needs to be corrected. Um, Mr. Mr. Now that you brought up solar panels, <laughs> okay. we've got two brand new ones in town. Oh, there's more coming. Yeah. I mean, I know. But can you relate to us of what we're realizing out of there as far as taxes and what the state gets? <laughs> just, just so people got an idea. One, one of the reasons that most towns went to square footage building permits is because they were losing out on taxation money. Because the state made all of these community solar projects less than 4.9 megawatts the state made them tax exempt. Right. So people are not paying personal property taxes on them. By constitution, if the state does a program like that, they have to reimburse the town 50%. So if you've got a $10 million solar project, which we would normally receive uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of, geez, I, I use 10 so I can make the math easier, but uh, I, I should have used a, a, a better number prepared for that. So let's say we, we would normally get $800,000 in taxes on a $10 million project. Now the state will reimburse us $400,000. So we do lose out on some of the taxation. We've got, including the Madison Electric one, we've got one, two, three, four. Four in place now and three more coming. 
Um, so it, and it's you know it's it's the way it is across across the state. But the what, town isn't realizing half of what they should be. Right, getting. we haven't realized anything yet. Yeah. Other than a few permit dollars. Yeah. But this year will be the first year. Well, let me take that back. I apologize. IGS Solar at Madison Electric has been paying taxes on that for the last six years, so my apologies there. But um, for these new developments, this year we'll see uh, taxation reimbursement from the state on three of those properties. So. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Gopi. You're sitting behind me now. Uh, on uh, how about this? This guy comes around and he pays what two hundred thousand. He has that little box he fills up with energy at during the night time. Yeah, yep. battery storage units. Yeah, so now is he going to go around and I assume he's going around with these other ones and try and do that with other, no? No, they're, they're, two, they're two separate entities. Some solar arrays have a battery storage unit. Right. Um, like there's a big one going in between Madison and Cornville that will. But most of these smaller ones don't have battery storage units. Those battery storage units don't fall under the tax exempt, so we do receive all of our property taxes off of those projects. And there's four of them in town. So. Okay. But that's not what this site review change is about. So do we want to vote on this, or are we going to wait for um, it to come up? It, I, we could probably do it at another meeting if we're, if we're doing any other ordinance changes. Yeah, I I that's where we usually, usually yeah. do that. Yeah. i just give you a chance to review it now. It's really just a simple change. All right, any questions, any other questions on that? All right, let's move on to uh, chapter 120, recall of elected officials. Mr. Gopian brought up this question at the last meeting. Why does our ordinance say accept a school board member? So I did some back and forth with Maine Municipal, found out that there is a uh, murky state law that says if you're going to recall school board elected members, you have to do that in a town charter, which Madison does not have a town charter. So the way MMA sees it is if, you, if your municipality doesn't have a town charter, you really don't have any way to recall a school board member. And whether that's right or wrong or fair, that's, that's the way they see it. Now what's interesting is before the legislature right now are two bills that deal with this. One of them is to change that and make it clear that a school board member can be recalled in exactly the same way as any other elected official in town. So that's in the legislature right now. Where that goes, I, I, I don't know. And just, just because we are the way we are in Maine, back in January, the town of Paris, Maine, in the RSU they were in, they didn't like what their school board members were doing, so they just went and held a recall election. And their attorneys told them, you shouldn't do it. Maine Municipal said, you shouldn't do it, but they did. And they recalled one member and the other member resigned. So, you know, you, you, you kind of get into the wild, wild west with, with recalls. And the state's trying to kind of corral this in a little bit. But that's what I found out about it. I, I don't, I certainly don't recommend changing our ordinance until the state changes this. Let, let's let the state deal with it first, rather than changing ours. That's my recommendation. Sounds good to me. Mr. Gopi. You don't think this is discriminatory? I didn't I mean, make it. If, I, if I, I you didn't take an elected one. official, if they're elected and you want to recall them, you can recall them. Why should, I, why should the uh, school district be different? And especially ours, where ours is all the citizens of Madison. Yep. Yeah. I think that's what they're trying to correct, right? I, I think that's happening at the state level. I, and again, this is my opinion. I mean, as the, if the board wants to bring this before the voters at town meeting, that's up to you. But I would rather let the state sort it out first, so that we're not we're not bringing something to town meeting that automatically goes against state statute, which right now it, it could be. All right. Thank you. Uh, we're going to bring this up again for a vote. Um, what, what would your what would you be voting on? Well, either I did matter to me either either all elected officials have recalled or not. Or not. We're not, we're not having any recall. But we're not allowed to do that though. So by the state law. Why not? So we don't have to have recall. 
We don't have to have it? No, you're right, we don't. Well, well that would have to go to town meeting. But so you, you would have to, at this level, you would have to pass a motion on the town meeting. Right. And your let the town people vote. Your 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 motion, if I'm understanding you correctly, one option could be you would bring the town meeting to eliminate chapter one twenty altogether. Right. No recalls. Right. Or you go to town meeting and say, we want to eliminate the line that says accept a school board member. So that all elected officials could be. Right. Yeah. I mean, we only had this in, in effect since the 90s, right? Right, 96, 97, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Well, have I mean, we I gone along without it all those years before? I think, I do think that, I mean, we brought this, this has been brought, I mean, before me, we brought this, that, this has been brought to the town meeting once, and they said yes for, to put this chapter 120 in. Did they know it read this way? They did back in 97. They did in 97. Since then, probably nobody's read it. So far this year. Right. Yes, ma'am. Hi. So, if we decided to recall someone on the school board, wouldn't that just open us up to a lawsuit? Because the state is saying that it's not okay because we don't have a charter? That, that I understand that was the legal advice given to the selectmen in Paris. The, the, their town attorney said, don't do it. Main municipal said, don't do it. And they did. I, and yeah, they did. I, and what happened? The one lady that was on the school board resigned, and the other person abided by the recall. They didn't fight it. They, not to my knowledge. Yeah. This was only January. This was only two months ago. So it's quite possible it was, it's the, the, the fight is coming, but I, I really don't know possible. So when we talk about these with the advisory board, let's bring it up again. You want to bring up the, the recall ordinance with the advisory board? Well, no. No. We, we talk about our ordinances going. Let's, okay. Let's bring it up again and we'll vote then. Okay. Who are you going to vote on? Well, whatever. Whatever. I raise my hand. Mr. Fort. <laughs> what are you going to vote on? If we make a, if a motion is made, we can talk about it again. Well, I, I don't think it would be very wise to I don't either. remove and Section 120 after the town people just used it and you folks voted to protect yourself with it. That, to me, that, that would fly in the face of what the community just did. As far as the school board's concerned, I think what well, he said, let's wait to see what the state says. I, that's I, what understand, I'm trying to do. I understand Bob's concern, why one and not the other. Well, the other, the state won't let us. If they're thinking about changing it to let us, then add it to 120 next year after they've done their magic in Augusta. All right, we'll wait. I don't think there's <coughs> anything to vote on myself. You guys can decide that, <laughs> and ladies. So what is our what is our pleasure? Just to let it die? I think chapter 120 is fine, but I... I do too. I don't think so. I think it's discriminatory. I don't. I. It should read: if you're elected official, no recall. Or it should read: all officials that get voted in have, re, uh, have recall. You can recall. Them. But our advice, our advice has been. But it's not. It doesn't mean. You, how long do you think this is going to be down? It won't come out of the house. It probably won't come out of anyway. The <coughs> advice that we have gotten from MMA <coughs> and may, lawyers may, is that, that you can't do what you're asking. So maybe no, it's, it's recommended. It's not saying you can't do it. Why would you waste money? Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh. Sorry. Am I misunderstanding something? But didn't the state say you can't? So it would be the state that would have to change it, correct? And there is a there is a bill in the House right now to do just that. So to, we should wait for that. Yes. That's what I'm trying to get to. Well, let's see what the state does. Yes, ma'am. I'm just saying I think it's, there's so many other things for us to worry about right now. Why would we worry about possibly entering into a court battle on something that 
if we just wait for the state to do their part, then we would be all set. All right, so let's wait her out. We're going to wait anyway, so let's see what happens. All right, number four, discuss matching grant award to CB law. So back in August, the town awarded several small matching grants to utilize the funds that were available. Uh, they awarded a $500 award to Corsa and Blaisdell, uh, which now goes by CB law. Um, they have provided the necessary receipts to show that they've spent more than their required match on a security system upgrade. And so um, I would need a motion uh, to pay them $500 out of ARPA funds um, for this matching grant. So moved. Second. <clears throat> we have a motion and a second to pay $500 to, to uh, CB Law for the upgrade to this upgrade to their business. Uh, any questions? Seeing none, all those in favor? All in favor, the motion carries. All right, selectmen's concerns. Mr. Moody? None, sir. Mr. Bean? I'm good. Mr. Gopian? None. Mrs. Dwyer? All right, citizens' concerns. Yes, ma'am. I'll make it quick because I know the meeting's gone late. Um, do we have any idea what the figure would be for us to have our own police department back the way that it was? Hold on. <laughs> I anticipated this question. It seems like a lot of people are quite dissatisfied with what we get for the money that we spend. So I know it would be more money, obviously, to go back to what we had, but. So you're right. It would be more money. That's the, the as what I said before about the sheriff handling that position of the chief, that makes it the least expensive option. Um, you also have taken into consideration the workforce. Even if you were to raise money, could you hire people? Um, Pittsfield has had a huge struggle. Waterville, Scalpegan, they've all had struggle hiring law enforcement. Back in 2015, the last police budget we had was $600,000, and that paid for seven people. Five patrol, one admin, one chief. If you were to take that exact same model at 600,000 with seven people, five patrol, a chief, an admin, you pay $927,000, almost a million. It'd surely go over a million after the first year. Um, if you were to take and create your own police department with three officers, one admin, and a chief, based on what, similar to what we have right now, that would cost about $780,000. So about $180,000 more than what we're paying the sheriff for right now. And most of that comes in finding and keeping and paying uh, a chief to administrate. That's the biggest difference. And does that ever go to a vote to the townspeople? Oh, wow. Now you're picking it. That sore is that I, I hope <laughs> that they healed up by now. I don't know. Mr. Fortner may still have a few. So this was back in 2014-15 when the decision was made at the budget advisory meeting to bring two different budgets to town meeting for police. One was to keep our own, and one was to go with the sheriff. And at that very contentious town meeting, they voted to go with the sheriff. So that, I mean, it's been a while. Yeah. But you had, had, had also remember that was a time of Madison paper closing, and right. things, yeah. were, things were very, very rough at that point. I mean, I, I think for the, another year where our hands are tied, because I don't think you could get it together by, oh, yeah. by July 1st. So, I mean, I, I think what could happen if, if, if we have reason, you know, if we have enough concern for that, that the, we're not meeting our needs, we could put together a group of people and, and look at that. I don't, I don't see why you couldn't put a committee together yeah. to look at to look at what it would look like. If there was enough momentum to do that, you'd have to shoot for something that would go to town meeting or at least go to the budget process this time next year. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I I think that. Again, based on the current market for law enforcement, I, I just, I, I, I don't think, in my opinion, I don't think Pittsfield's gonna make it. I think eventually Pittsfield's gonna turn over to the county. Did you um, draw up this schedule for these three officers? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm that, serious. That, that, it, it, that is not the schedule. That is how it works in my brain. Okay. Right, having three deputies, on a rotating schedule to cover the shifts. 
I, I know it's not how they schedule it at the sheriff's office. It's okay. It's just Deputy A gets out of work at 2 a.m. and has to be back at 6 a.m. So I'm just don't know that three deputies. Well, that is not the official schedule. All right. It's just, how it works in my Mr. Room. Moody. Yeah, just to end this thing a little bit, uh, if this town was to go back to the previous type of police department, you couldn't afford it. You really couldn't afford it. Not only that, the job is not enticing out there anymore. And this is, this is not just statewide, it's countrywide. Mm -hmm. They cannot get people, hire them faster. They're not interested in the job. And once you, once you start a new department, unless you can get what they call a blue pin, an already trained officer, it's very, very expensive to bring that person on board and put them through the training and the updates and all that. You really, you really would surprise you uh, what it would cost you for it. And, and you wouldn't be any further ahead. None. Because it's, I mean, a call is a call and a response is a response, whether it's blue, brown, or, or gray. It doesn't make any difference. You, th we, this town couldn't afford it. It really it wouldn't. If it was to be broken down to it, it would amaze you, really. Mr. Mr. Fortin. Why don't we take a shot at figuring out what's not working yeah. and talk to the chief about making it work yeah. before we reinvent the wheel? How many complaints have you had at the town office? <coughs> not many. I understand where the fire chief is coming from because he's on scene mm -hmm. and he's struggling with what he's seeing. But I, I really don't get a whole lot of complaints at the town office. Yeah. So we pull those guys together, yeah. the sheriff and the fire chief yeah. and yeah. George. We knew about solving <coughs> the issue before yeah. we spent a lot of money. All right, any other citizen concerns? Seeing none, we'll look for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. A motion and a second to adjourn. All those in favor? All in favor, motion carries. Motion adjourn at 8 11. Before you run off, I do need some signatures. I didn't know for a week. It was right around Christmas.